And what did you say you were? And he said he wanted to introduce yourself. I said I'm a middle-aged uh, get. <laughs> I was going to say I'm one, one, one sandwich over the limit. <laughs> one sandwich away from being fat. <laughs> but I'm over the limit. <laughs> Put the thing up. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, man, yeah. let's shoot this. I'm ready. Okay, we're rolling. Are you rolling? Been rolling since I <laughs> Movie night. Movie talk. <laughs> this is the outtakes, yeah? yeah? that's right. I hope you can hear me. Let me put the mic on this side. Hello there. My name is Louis Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I feel like a 17-year-old. Hi, I'm Louis. <laughs> Out of the system. Okay. Oh boy, don't worry, we can we can keep we doing can this. Well my makeup is fucked up. <laughs> Still love is gonna <laughs> disappear <laughs> soon. Yeah, the first Your one is like this. <laughs> well, the crew is oh, better, God. you know. Remember when we used to shoot back in the days? We were we were taking it seriously, yeah. Jane in the back, making yeah, noises. Yes. <laughs> we won't take it. What? Hey, what's going on, man? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to pass. Well, don't. I got a good idea. <laughs> I hope we finish laughing now. <laughs> <laughs> Middle-aged kid, don't forget. <laughs> it's fine to laugh. I'll cut it. <laughs> no, I'll leave it in. <laughs> you do this for the next half hour. I can tell. Oh, here's oh, come going. on. Let's go. Oh, there we, we go. go. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey. Only in the floor. Yeah. Okay. okay, I go first, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, what was the list of shit that was, that was too long? <laughs> Let me do it in a different way. Just slightly different. <coughs> Give me a second. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Louis Michael. You might recognize me from... Uh, no, this is not... Look, sorry. Yeah, we're doing <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Louis Michael. You might know me for uh, the comic book Chromosome 96. Uh, what you might not know me for is f as the creator of one of the highest selling uh, ash cans from the 90s called uh, the Underground Adventures, the adventures of a, a hound dog and his companions. Uh, but you also might know that I've dabbed a little bit in filmmaking. Uh, from uh, stop motion movies and to the animation through a little bit of documentary and also live action. And with me, I have. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Ian Thomas. I'm a middle aged git, as you can see. And uh, I'm also sporting a belly as um, framed by one sandwich over the limit. <laughs> and uh, today we're going to go over uh, First Blood, the Stallone film, and we're going to do a retrospective on it. It's over! Nothing is over! Nothing! You just don't turn it off. It wasn't my war. You asked me, I didn't ask you. Hi, well, in Movie Talk, uh, the idea is that we're going to look back on uh, a number of titles from movies from the, well, 70s and 80s uh, that um, maybe did not receive too much um, accolade at the time and also have perhaps subsequently fallen off the radar. But the first uh, movie we're going to be talking about is, uh, I think you'll recognize this one, First Blood, uh, which was the title actually of the first Rambo movie and spawned a whole sequence of uh, movies that actually veer away somewhat from the um, solidity of the first movie. Michael, are you going to tell us a little bit about the movie itself? Uh, based on a novel from 1972, uh, it was actually quite a violent book in where the hero, a uh, veteran from the Vietnam War, returns home to find uh, harassment law enforcement uh, trying to uh, punish him and eventually takes um, kind of a, a justice uh, way into his own hands and ends up killing a series of uh, officers of the law. Now obviously the, the script was, uh, well the plot was slightly toned down for the movie as we learned today by Stallone himself which had a hand in screenplay mm -hmm. in the final draft. Like everybody knows, uh, First Blood is, is the first of a series of movies but uh, at his genesis, First Blood really is a story about one guy isolated in a town, uh, surrounded by a slightly hostile environment, both natural uh, and man-made. That's one of the reasons I like the movie very much and why I wanted to bring it to this show. I think uh, over the years, the original concept of the movie and the original idea kind of uh, got to be diluted as obviously the, the spawn of franchise and uh, become a, became more of a commercial uh, entity 
uh, which, uh, you know, even toys and cartoons were made out of it. That's right. I mean, uh, Rambo actually becomes uh, quite totemic in the 80s and I think even going into the 90s as a sort of symbol of uh, American uh, imperialism, whereas in fact the first movie uh, can be viewed as uh, in the context of uh, Vietnam movies or uh, coming home movies. They were mostly made in the 70s, those movies, Vietnam and the coming home uh, from war. Uh, I think they had a, a, a break right in the end of the 70s and early 80s, although obviously Deer Hunter was uh, still 78, mm. I think it was still a big uh, deal at the box office. Mm. Uh, but well, I think um, and we should remember that I mean there are quite melodramatic uh, elements to the Deer Hunter as well, which I think at the time was seen as quite a naturalistic film. But I mean the climax with the uh, Russian roulette, yes. I always found very uh, melodramatic. And I think the same can be said about Rambo that there are melodramatic um, elements to it. But well, I mean yeah. one of the striking things I find about Rambo is 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 the location is that for a Vietnam movie it is solely set in America. And the hostile environment is one of the landscape of America. Yes. It's parts an adventure movie, yeah. parts an action movie, and yeah. parts a melodrama. Yeah. And uh, I think that it's that marriage of these three components that make First Blood uh, different from the other Vietnam movies mm. and the other coming back home movies. Mm. Uh, sets it apart and obviously, you know, turns into a commercial success enough to spawn into a franchise. Right, and I was, as I was saying, by the end of the 70s, I think uh, studios and audiences' interest had turned into the sci-fi genre, mainly because of the big hit that Star Wars was in 1977. So really, by the time 82 comes around and First Blood comes out, I think finally there was a resurgence of the melodrama, the, the, the soldier as a rogue guy, uh, mm having to face his own dilemmas and uh, so on and so forth. First Blood really kind of reignited that, so in, in, to a point that after First Blood, eventually we had another batch of uh, Vietnam movies with Platoon, Hamburger Hill, born on the 4th of July. So that's already late 80s, but uh, mostly uh, there is really a gap between the, the late 70s with the Deer Hunter and, uh, and then all the way to well, meet. What's interesting about First Blood is that it's actually addressing Vietnam fairly obliquely. Um, it's quite unusual actually in that it addresses what, you know, we've come to call um, PTSD now mm -hmm. quite directly in the movie. But, uh, and there's, there's a very, it's, it's addressed quite, quite um, strongly at the end of the movie. But the majority of movie is essentially just an action movie, yes. um, a renegade movie. You know, I mean, I do, I do enjoy that the, there is quite a lot of um, uh, technical aspects to the movie that I think have been lost, both by the critics and over the years, uh, obviously, because the, the, the franchise kind of shrouded a little bit of mm. the, the actual mm. Mm. proficient way that this movie is done. And uh, starting off with, with him, daylight scene, all smiles, visiting uh, the last remaining uh, brother in arms uh, homestead, and then mm. finding out that yes, he, he has died of cancer. Mm. And as soon as that scene ends, uh, so does what could have been a story, a movie, and that's not the movie we're gonna mm. have. Mm. And yeah, from exactly. then on, on, on onwards until the end is all depression. Mm. It's uh, it's sad. It's uh, it's um, it's poignant. It's also uh, crushing. There's, there's always a little bit of duality between uh, what the hero can do as almost like the villain, which is something mm. you mentioned before, yeah. as Rambo actually is kind of a villain, That's right. although I see him more as the anti-hero. Yeah, well, he is essentially framed as the villain, um, although technically he's the hero of the movie. I um, mean, it's quite interesting that, like all strong men, um, he actually spends uh, the majority of the movie not saying anything. So, in a way, the more interesting um, dramatic uh, tension is actually developed um, by the other two key actors in the movie, who are uh, Brian Dennehy, who plays the sheriff of the town of Hope. Okay, let's underline that clearly so we don't get the message lost. It's like and, a shot in the town called Hope. Uh, Some of it, most of it. <laughs> It's a real town. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's set in Montana or Wyoming, we believe, but it's also shot in the beautiful landscape of British Columbia. So Columbia. maybe uh, not everything isn't as it seems. But uh, the the other main character is um, Richard Krenner, 
mm. who appears uh, quite interestingly, and it's, it's a good dynamic about halfway through the film, or towards halfway through the film, yeah. and plays basically um, Rambo's uh, former commando from uh, commander from Vietna Vietnam. And this, of course, um, enables us to, to get a bit more of his backstory, because none of the backstory is actually, uh, or the character of Rambo is, is presented um, by any through any dialogue, it's only actually presented through action, which of course is a very pure form of filmmaking. Yeah, he's, uh, he's an action hero, so he's an action man. So, uh, and mm. whatever backstory there is, he's given as exposition. Right. And, and in, in, ca in any case, uh, in, in any case, in any, mm, let me rephrase that. In case we were in any doubt, he appears uh, throughout most of the film dressed as an action man too. I mean, there isn't a length of cord long enough that he can use as a bandana in most of his scenes. Uh, he, he arranges himself with whatever is available, so obviously most of his uh, muscular body is on show. That's right, which, uh, uh, although I find it quite interesting that uh, he chooses to disguise himself as a scarecrow in the early parts of the movie by putting a uh, cut-up uh, <laughs> garbage bag over his head. It's an interesting movie because obviously, you know, uh, we got to address the photography, obviously. It's all shot in winter. And uh, give a quick nod to the uh, DP yes, who's called uh, Andrew Laszlo. Andrew Laszlo. Okay, so it's all it's all really bleak environment. So the photography is quite grey, muddy when you get into the wood shots. Uh, then there's bursts of colors, and it's mainly by fire and explosions. Yeah. Uh, obviously, then the hero has to carry big guns throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. uh, starts off with a knife only, but ends up with huge, heavy, heavy duty guns. So that that is basically the, the the action component of the movie. And that's one one wonders what uh, the producers really wanted to do with the script. If they wanted a melodrama, if they wanted a straight action film, the film feels very much throughout. Maybe not so mm. much in the beginning. Definitely not in the end, as as the 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 story comes to a closure. But uh, I think the middle middle section really plays out as an adventure slash action movie. And I think that's that's the idea that Karolka wants always mm. wanted to do with their films. They want to mm. make commercial viable films. Mm. They want a star vehicle, star power. Mm. They want something well shot, well edited, with good music that drives audiences to the to the to the theaters. Uh, so a lot of people will perceive First Blood only as a straight actioner. But I see more than that in it. Uh, yeah, I think it's like, okay, the coming coming back home story for the poor man, basically, for the average working uh, audience member uh, that uh, will not be so interested in the melodrama, more interested into the action mm. and the adventure side of it. And so it's kind of almost the premise kind of is roping in the mm. average uh, viewer. And then once he's in, they're going to give him what he really wants. So that's one way to look at it. But I think that the, the basis for the movie is, 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 a, is a truthful novel. It's, it's a good, serious novel. It's a serious material. Yeah, there's, there's clearly a serious intent behind the, behind the movie. Yeah, uh, I, although it kind of book ends the movie, I think it's still there. And um, I think that's the bit that is lost in translation or is lost over time. Uh, maybe with just like a frivolous view of the movie, just by looking at it as an action film, mm. action piece. But I really think it's the melodrama, um, given through the dialogue, the, the bare dialogue that exists mainly between the police chief and mm. the Rambo's uh, colonel. Yeah. Uh, and I, but I think there's enough there to, co to well, that, those convey scenes, the message. Yeah, those scenes really spell out what sort of the ambiguity of the movie is. I mean, what. What's interesting is that uh, because the hero is essentially uh, the anti-hero, the villain in the movie, and the, as it were, the heroes are the villains, as in the police and the forces of authority, yes. sets up an interesting dynamic, I think, 
in the audience who are not quite in not quite sure where their sympathies are meant to lie. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, remember the initial shots of the movie, you know, Rambo mm. gets to the homestead, his heart is broken, and we straight away cut to the police chief yeah. uh, starting his day, getting out of the police station. I was pointing out to that shot to Ian in the beginning. He puts his on his cowboy hat. Yeah. He pulls his stomach up like, yeah. I just had a good so breakfast. It's, it's a great opening day. shot, isn't it? And it's a traditional uh, bureaucratic uh, agent of the law that is just going to go step by step in a, what he calls a boarding town. Mm. And he's going to grab this guy, which mm. he sees as a drifter, as a beggar, and he's going to push him out of yeah, the I, I, I was a bit reminded of uh, Gene Hackman's um, role in uh, The Unforgiven, in which uh, he really sees his role essentially as uh, maintaining order in, in the town. Yeah, so it's um, a sheriff. Yeah. They're both the same kind of character. So. And uh, again, you know, reintroducing him as the sheriff automatically, you see him as, as the noble figure in the uh, narrative. Although he immediately, uh, by taking exception to uh, Rambo coming in uh, into town, he, he immediately starts behaving in an unreasonable way. And I think it's a lot to be said for uh, Brian Dennehy's def- uh, performance that even till the end of the movie, you essentially are, re- see him as, a, as quite a sympathetic character. I wonder why the Pentagon would send a full bird colonel down here to handle this. The Army thought I might be able to help. <laughs> well, I don't know in what way. Rambo's a civilian now. He's my problem. I don't think you understand. I didn't come here to rescue Rambo from you. I came here to rescue you from him. Well, we all appreciate your concern, Colonel. I will try to be extra careful. As I was saying, uh, away from the action scenes, I think much of the uh, dramatic dynamic uh, is between um, uh, Krenner's character and uh, Dennehy's uh, character as the sheriff. I think there's, there's quite an interesting um, uh, axis point in the movie when um, Stallone's character Rambo is holed up in a, uh, in a mine shaft, an abandoned mine shaft, when the movie goes all um, um, goonies on us. Uh, there are quite a few uh, interesting number of scenes uh, prior to that with the uh, involving the National Guard, which are the, which are actually quite funny, and uh, that whole sequence also reminded me a bit of um, Walter Hill's Southern Comfort. But anyway, back back to that axis point. I think that, that until that point, it's it's almost like Dennehy's character has driven driven sort of the action. From then onwards, uh, Krenner, who's obviously the Colonel, uh, takes over more of the uh, control of the action. And uh, also that uh, the, the, there's a shift in the action from uh, taking place during the daytime to uh, to nighttime, and uh, uh, I think the camera works uh, very effective uh, in, in both both those sections of the movie. Well, the film is all very well shot. Yeah. I mean, first, we got the epic backdrop of the, the scenery, uh, mm-hmm. and that is one interesting thing actually that we, we learned recently is that Cindy Pollock was due to direct this. It was one of the uh, directors through which the project had uh, passed through. And uh, Cindy Pollock had shot Jeremiah Johnson with Robert Redford, which was just basically a similar story of an outcast, uh, a guy that decides to go and break bonds with society, live on by its own, uh, so against the elements and against uh, mm. other humans, uh, mm. Indians, uh, and as he's, uh, mm. the story set in the f- uh, western frontier of the USA. Uh, so it's no surprise that Sidney Pollock was at once attached to direct this. I find a few parallels between uh, Jeremiah Johnson and First Blood. Mm. Uh, obviously First Blood is a more political film. Well, picking up on that point that... Um uh, Lewis had just made about um, being uh, the outcast. Uh, there's also a, a clear movement from sort of uh, man against the elements, which is what, uh, say, the first um, half to two thirds of the movie are, um, with um, a Rambo really at his, um, at, you know, surviving best uh, in, in the elements. Uh, and uh, the, there's quite a strong elemental feeling to, um, to that section of the movie. And of course, when it comes into um, the third act, um, and he becomes the man against society, um, which because the third act all takes place back in the the village of Hope and and at night time, and it is quite ridiculous how um, Rambo uh, manages actually to hold the entire um, town hostage 
um, with, with a huge repertoire of weaponry at his, uh, at his disposal. You don't actually see anyone else on the streets. <laughs> I don't know why, because there's nothing mentioned at any point of the third act that uh, the people have actually just moved indoors. I mean, yeah. I mean, Rambo is given as dead until right at the last minute when they say, no, he's still on the loose because one of our uh, trucks from the uh, the militia has just yeah. been... Uh, uh, it's just been taken, just disappear. There's, there's, a, there's a wonderful transition where um, uh, one scene ends with him basically uh, running a, a barricade uh, in daytime, uh, yes. which appears to be more or less on the outskirts of the town. And then, um, as it were, um, half a mile down the road, it's already nighttime, yes. and uh, he's um, wreaking revenge on a petrol station. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's the Karolko F work, isn't it? I mean, again, poetic justice. We cannot forget License. Sorry. that, although, you know, I mean, I, I personally believe the film is wonderfully shot, it's uh, very, uh, well. very well edited, yeah. uh, but obviously it's got those pitfalls of uh, a kind of a low to middle range production house from the 80s, so he's got a lot of, uh, we were uh, having fun while watching the movie with the library sounds <laughs> that they have. You know, the, the, the guns, the falls, the punches, yeah. all of it seems, uh, ex well, besides all the ADR going on. Well, yeah, uh, it was from taken from the, uh, the BBC LP of sound effects I, I had in the 1980s, and very good it was too. Yeah, and that's really, that really determines the, the quality of the movie. I've, well, I think that's, that's that bit of Karolko saying, you know, well, this is something for mass consumption. Mm. And all we wanted really is an actor that could, uh, you know, that was a hit with the crowd at the time, that could pull this off. Mm. And, and Stallone pulls, pulls it off. I mean, it, the criticism that goes towards Stallone as an actor, uh, f for me, although you won't agree with this one, is the same criticism that Marilyn Monroe got throughout her career. These were guys that, uh, you know, they were never seen as great actors. I think Stallone thoroughly pulls this off. Um, you know, I, I actually think that Crane is actually overacting a little bit uh, because we also got to know that he replaced <laughs> Kirk Douglas at the last minute, at the last possible minute. There was actually already promotion material done for this movie with Douglas on the posters. That's so right. at the last moment... Whereas, uh, as, as, as Lewis he, says, I mean, once you get into your head the thought that uh, Kirk Douglas was going to be in the role, you actually cannot see anyone else taking that role. And, Exactly. Krenner does a very, very good um, um, possible impersonation. Yeah, I think Douglas. he's impersonating Douglas. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, he's not playing himself, he's playing Douglas a little bit. On the visual side of it is a impressively shot movie. And it has to be. It's a movie with stunts, it's a movie yeah. with uh, doubles. It, it compensates as well by being a character study. Uh, and that's the bit that, again, that's the reason why this was our choice of uh, the first movie of this series, uh, just to, to kind of pass along the idea for the yes. series of videos. And I, and I think it's, it's interesting to, to talk about at, at that moment, um, the, the actual um, um, climax of the movie, um, which is a scene between um, Krenner and, and, and uh, Stallone, yeah. um, in which um, it, the movie takes a very strange turn at that point because, you know, through most of the movie, as I, as I think I said, I mean, Stallone's talking through his actions, yes. and uh, he's quite articulate when it comes to his actions. I mean, a fantastic array of um, handcrafted weaponry he can uh, use to um, Very variously quickly. mutilate the, um, the legal authority in the, the middle United of the States. woods, in, in the, the dark. Woods. Very quickly, I mean, he makes a lot of traps. You know, I think uh, MacGyver took it, took a few uh, pointers <laughs> from him, uh, and then it's sort of there's a scene. It reminded me actually a bit of the scene um, at the end of um, Ang Lee's. Um, uh, Incredible Hulk with uh, Nick Nolte. All right, uh, <laughs> and uh, well, it becomes quite dramatic. In Eric Nolte, Banner, yeah. uh, uh, rather confusedly, Eric Banner plays yeah. Doctor Banner, doesn't he? Doctor Banner, yeah. Isn't it? yeah. Uh, it, which, it, it, you almost get the, that feeling of uh, New York fringe theatre, sort of improvised theatre, with um, uh, um, Stallone's um, Stallone's performance there on. You're not quite sure whether to laugh or to go. Actually, he's really putting his um, heart into the performance. Yeah, he's there. putting his heart into the performance. And I, I'm, I'm tempted to, to agree with you on that. I think um, Lewis might have been doing me a slight disservice. I think Stallone's an interesting case study in that he was, to the start of his career, a very creditable actor, and at some point he decided that um, you know the two-dimensional um, 
uh, action hero was more befitting of him. But I mean, the first um, Rocky movie, for instance, a fantastic performance. And I think there are other couple of um, um, movies like uh, Fist, for instance. Yes, with a syndicate. Yes, the the, the union guy. And is there another one to do with um, there is domino night... players or something? Well, there is the one right at the beginning of the eighties, which has Billy Dee Williams and Rutger Hauer. Is it Nighthawks? Oh yes, that's true. Yes, yes. And uh, he actually cut off. Uh, he, again, he had a play in the, the last, the final cut of that movie. But it, they're very interesting characters that Stallone insists on playing in the beginning of his career. These guys, we saw disillusioned heroes, and they end up always losing in the end. They win in some way, kind mm. of a moral victory, but it's both a physical and a literal loss. Uh, mm. Rocky loses the final fight, and uh, Rambo loses as well, and that's, that's what I find endearing in this movie is the ending, and uh, there was other ending uh, where uh, the hero actually dies, and a lot of people, you know, again, because this is seen as an action movie, and he gets to the end, and the drama becomes more important, and a lot of, like Ian was saying, you don't know if you should laugh or cry, so basically the, the, the ending of the movie kind of uh, became almost like a footnote. I, I find the ending very important, uh, because the ending is, is the, the fit conclusion, the fit closure to a movie that starts on a completely different note. The exact first frames of the movie are something else. They're, they're something about someone with hope and eventually walks into a town called Hope. And, uh, and then in the end of the movie, it's nighttime as opposed to the first shots of the movie, which is a bright sunny day. And, mm -hmm. uh, and the hero slash anti-hero slash possible villain uh, after being being able to survive throughout the movie, is finally uh, taken in by the law. Uh, well, by the law that is supposed to serve him as much as protect him. And at the same time, well, kind of keep him in line. But I think that's the whole the whole point being discussed in the movie. It's, it's, uh, it's a battle between the man and the, the element, not just the physical element, but the... The, the, the society element, you know, the, the psychological element that society crushes mm. uh, onto the individual. And, uh, and that, I think, is, that is one of the, I think that's one of the ideas behind the novel. Mm. Well, there's no question that, I mean, in that, in that final sequence, uh, the, the final scene, that um, the substance of, of what um, Rambo says is actually extremely powerful. And, uh, and I think it's possible to, 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 to take a reading of the movie to say that there is some form of redemption for the character at the end. Although, oh, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, in subsequent movies, that redemption includes uh, going off and shooting at America's enemies. I think First Blood Part Two is actually a terrible film. She's actually the only one, uh, one of the few films that Stallone directed himself. Uh, together mm. with Staying Alive, which actually is not that bad of a movie. <laughs> Maybe even one day we'll do a, a review well, on I Staying think, Alive. Well, I think Lewis should start a fan club now for <laughs> Staying Alive. I yes, think. I, I do like that one. Most definitely putting his uh, signature at the top of that list. I actually sympathize more with Rambo 3, which is actually a good, solid action movie. I have no problems with it. It's typical, a typical ladies movie, a lot of brash, a lot of balls, very little talk. But this is a different beast. This is a dramatic film uh, dressed up as an action movie to be sold to the general audience. And that, I think, is the general idea that we were trying to get to here uh, as the conclusion to this is that, uh, you know, uh, First Blood has more layers to it than what you might think, you know. Well, what I take away from the movie, I think there are um, three things essentially. I mean, I think the sort of um, the movement, the, the classic storytelling of the uh, uh, of the movie needs to be mentioned, um, and uh, you know the movement from country into the town. Um, the camera work is fantastic. I find it very interesting the way that it sort of turns on its heads, turns on its head the conventional idea of the hero in it, as it were, making the hero the villain and the good guys the bad guys. And, you know, I think it makes a, a pretty good job of, of um, raising some, some really quite strong issues in, in something that's uh, essentially um, just an action movie. Um, so I think it's, it's that dynamic, really, between sort of the meaning behind the movie and the action of the movie, the sort of tension between the two that, that makes it stand out quite so much. Yeah, 
Well, I think we pretty much uh, went through this movie. Uh, you'll find many other uh, reviews and critiques on it. Uh, this is our interpretation of it. And for today, we stay here. And we'll be bringing up other titles over the course of the next weeks. And the, any other titles you might want us to uh, discuss, we'd be quite happy if you want to leave it in the comments. Yeah. And obviously, you would have to like this video and subscribe to the channel. So uh, right. thank you very much. And I look forward to regurgitating some movies later on as well. Okay. So this was the premiere episode of Movie Talk, and we'll see you guys again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.